right, so tonight we are teaching, or I'm teaching on, for they are bread for us. The power of perception and the dangers of complaining and unbelief. And it's based out of the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and 14, and also Deuteronomy, chapter 30 and 31, and Joshua 14. So Numbers 13 and 14 is part one, and, number, and Deuteronomy 30 and 31 is part two. And this is what I mean. So this is about Moses. When God brought the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and they passed through the Red Sea, and then they, um, he said, I, he promised them, he swore to them a land with milk flowing with milk and honey. So Moses called one Israelite from all the 12 tribes of Israel, and among them was Joshua and Caleb. And he sent them into the land they were to take as their inheritance for to scout it out as spies for 40 days. And then he said, bring back fruit because it was the season of the grapes. So this group of 12 went out 40 days and they spied it out and then they came back and that's where we are right now. So Numbers 13, 27 through 28. Then they told him and said, so this is the spies. We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. And they had a big cluster of grapes and figs. And it was so big, they had to, they had to carry it on a big pole, carry between two of them. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The descendants of Anak were the giants. There were giants in the land. And the giants were fierce. And they ate animals and they ate people and they were warriors. So chat, now we'll go down to 13. Uh, Numbers 13, 30 through 33. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report. And the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And they're talking about the giants. Verse 33. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the, the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight so we're going to break this down so the first part is 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 they were complaining and the one thing that they said that is uh very profound is the last tag and they said and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight. So how we perceive ourselves is how we present ourselves. And how we present ourselves is how we are seen. So they came as in fear and not in faith. They were, and so within them, they, they came in fear, not in faith. So outside of them, they were viewed as timid rather than bold. So it's an inward battle with an outward expression. And this speaks to us. If we come in faith, our outward expression is boldness. If we come in fear, we will be easily overcome. So Caleb didn't see the giants, but he saw God's desire and the promise of his word because God said, I am bringing you into a land 
flowing with milk and honey. So because he held on to that word, he didn't see the giants. He just saw God's word because he said, let's go up at once. He said, let's go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Why? Because he had God's word and he knew it was by God's strength and power and not their own. So the other spies, so the other spies only saw themselves and they were measuring the giants to themselves. But Caleb saw God and he measured the giants to God. And he said, we can easily overcome it. Let's go up at once. Oh, it's so good. So... Caleb had a different, um, all right, so we're going to go Numbers 14, 23 through 24. They certainly, this is God speaking. He said, because this angered him, when the Israelites were complaining, what it was is they entered into unbelief, and this was incredibly insulting and offensive to God. He said, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. So Caleb had a different spirit. What spirit is that? So we have to understand that the Old Testament is revealed in the new, in the, in the, the, in the, in the, it reveals the New Testament. You know what I'm saying? So I'll, I'll get to that. That's typology. Caleb had a different spirit. What do we know about that from the New Testament? In 2 Timothy 1.7, it said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The other ten spies, they came in a spirit of fear, but Caleb and Joshua, they came in a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. He, so... Hebrews 3, 7 through 12, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. He's talking about the exact story and numbers that we're, we're referencing, we're talking about, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. There's so much in here. So first off, complaining opens the door to hardness of hearts and unbelief. Unbelief keeps us in the wilderness. To enter the promised land, the good land, is to enter God's rest. That is what, this, so in Numbers, this is not a story of salvation. This is a story of overcoming. This is a story of going forth in the power of God and, and taking a hold of what he desires to give us because what he desires to give us is not about us. It's to fulfill his desires, but he is for us and we need to be for him. So there is a stark difference between the 10 spies and the Israelites and Caleb and Jacob. The one were complaining and it brought an unbelief. And God said his own words. They always is aware that he said, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial, the wilderness. Verse 12, he says, beware brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing 
from the living God. So when we are complaining, and we're going to look at this, it's, it's going to be in the next section. When we are complaining, we are complaining against God. And we are opening ourselves up to unbelief. And God says to have a heart of unbelief is to have an evil heart. Complaining opens the door for unbelief. And also, he says, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. And if you look up here, Caleb, in, in Numbers 14, uh, verse 24, it, God says, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has fully and has followed me fully. How was Caleb able to follow him fully? Because he knew God's ways. He knew his word and he followed it. He did not consider anything else. He didn't even consider himself because the Israelites and the 10 spies, they were only considering themselves, their own security, their own comfort, their own benefit. But Caleb, he focused on God, his interests, what he said his word and his desire of what they need to accomplish and he held tight to that and he didn't see what the Israelites saw he only saw God how do you see God you have to know him you have to know his word and you have to know his ways it says that we redeem the time by knowing what the will of the Lord is and then we do it and we do that by reading his word it is so good. So Numbers 14, verse 2 through 4. And just understand that I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth because I'm pulling New Testament into the Old Testament because it connects us to our present um, state. I highly suggest and I encourage to read Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And what I did is I read it several times a day. This message, this entire message, has have, I've been in it for a while, and I have been reading it over and over and over again, especially Numbers 14, chapter or chapter 14, verse 9. It's like I am, I am carving that scripture into my mind and burning it into my heart. It is so encouraging and profound. Um, so Numbers 14, 2 through 4. And it says, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Okay, I'm going to break this down into two parts. So when we complain, we complain against the Lord, and he takes it personal. It is an insult and it is offensive to God because in Numbers 14, 26 and 27. Now, mind you, remember in verse two, it said and the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. Now, if we go down to Numbers 14, 26 and 27, it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me. I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Now they were complaining to Aaron and Moses, but God is saying, I have heard the complaints against me. We have to understand when we are murmuring and complaining, is it against God? And we will know why I will expound on it in a minute. So to complain is to murmur. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. Now, complaining is a murmuring. Disputing is to argue, to reason in our mind. So murmuring is a condition of the heart. We do it in our heart. And 
Disputing is what we do with our mind. We murmur within us and we reason with our mind and we lean on our own understanding and it pulls us right out of faith. Verse 15, that you may become blameless. So I'm going to go from 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. This is a reflection of what we just read. So when we, it, Paul is saying, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault. That what separates us though there's many things but this is saying when we complain and murmur we are corrupted we are defiled by our own mouth because it says in order to become blameless and harmless children of god without fault we are not to complain and murmur because it's against God directly. And we will soon find out as we go through this teaching that all the things we go through, trials, tribulations, sufferings, hardships, obstacles, they're for our growth. It's so that we can mature in the life according to the life within us, which is Christ, that he, what? he may be formed in us and we may become to the full stature of the perfect man in Christ. It's God's sanctification process. This life on earth is not for our comfort. We are to persevere, we are to suffer, and we are to go forward in obedience, in humility and gentleness, because that is the will of God. And this is is so for me <laughs> so like this is this like i really encourage you guys numbers 13 and 14 read it and i mean read it every day for 30 days it'll really change your perspective and also In verse 16 of Philippians 2, it says, holding fast the word of life. That's what Caleb did. Instead of murmuring and complaining and entering into unbelief and pulling all the other Israelites into that unbelief through fear, he held fast to the word of life, which was the promise of God. And that's why he didn't see what the other ten saw. That's why he didn't see the giants. He saw himself as the giant in their sight. Oh gosh, it's so good. Okay, so Hebrews 3, 14 through 19, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning. Now this, uh, this is speaking to, remember when the Israelites said, it would have been better for us to return to Egypt. So this Hebrews 3 is referencing that, 14 through 19. For we have become partakers of Christ if we Hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the rebellion. That's Numbers 13 and 14. For who having heard rebelled indeed? Was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? whose corpses fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest but to those who did not obey so we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief so for us so the the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt and God was bringing them to the wilderness and bringing them into the land, the good land, the promised land. And they saw the, well, 
the ten spies saw the giants. They 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 complained and they and they and they entered into unbelief. And because of their words, it brought the other Israelites into unbelief. And they said, "Would not it be better if we were in Egypt? Let us go back. Pick a leader for ourselves to go back to Egypt." This infuriated God, and this is for us today, because God is not only bringing us out of the bondage of whatever that is for us. Our Egypts are all well. Sin is sin, but whether it be addictions, sexual immorality, gambling, no matter what it is, pride. It's it could be all these things. It's all in the New Testament. No matter what it was, how many of us when we not even when we've been when we've been delivered and pulled out of Egypt out of bondage by God but we come up against something that we perceive as impossible and it'll cause us to get out of ourselves and get into the faith that is of God the only way to come out of ourselves is to come into Christ and stay there. The moment we come back and we consider ourselves and we consider our comfort, our own inconveniences, our own feelings and mindsets, we're no longer abiding in Christ. We're abiding in ourselves. And then what? How many people go back to where God has pulled them out of? How many people, even if it's God has brought them out, they've been following God and says, okay, I want you to leave here and I want you to go here. But there is a space in a time. There is a gap. And Anthony alone would, would, would point to this when, when the New Testament says from grace to grace to glory to glory, there is a space in between here and there where you feel like it's the desert, it's the wilderness. You're like, okay, I'm not here, but I'm not there. It's uncomfortable. It's scary. There's uncertainties. But we are not to go back to Egypt. We have to keep going forward and know that the Lord is leading us by our hand. And as he brought us out, out of here, he is raising stuff up over here. He is building stuff over here. And we need that place in between here and there so we can grow in faith and grow in intimacy with God. And we can mature. It's powerful. We are not to go back to Egypt, including in our mind. We are not to go back. Okay. Isaiah 48, 22, it says, There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 32, it says, Come to me, this is Jesus, all you who labor are on a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So, to think that we can go back and not enter in, there will never be rest or peace. It's only going forward, going into where God is calling us, where we will find rest and peace. To enter into God's rest is to enter into the good land God has called us into. If we think that we can just veer off, go our own way, or go over here, or do this because it's more comfortable or easier, we will never find peace because we will be in sin. It's unbelief. We do not believe God, and we will not go, and we depart from Him, even if we still remain in the places where we were, like church or Bible studies, but if we are not following Him. We are in unbelief. And we are, uh, we are in unbelief. There is no rest for us. There is no peace for us. We will never find it anywhere else. Because he is the rest. So Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Jesus so it says they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They did not obey. They did not know his ways. The yoke that Jesus is talking about, that he says, take my yoke upon you, 
It's his ways, it's his commands. He says, my burden is easy and it is light. Compared to the burden of sin or our own ways, we can't bear that burden. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins and rose again that we could die with him and live with him. And to take his burden, his yoke, is to walk in his ways, to, to walk according to his commands, to walk in obedience. Because in Romans 14, 23, it says, For whatever is not from faith is sin. So we come to the separation of two classes. Those who enter in by faith and those who wander in the wilderness for rebelling against the Lord and unbelief. And the Israelites, they wandered in the wilderness till their carcasses fell to the ground. They died in the wilderness. And so it is this day. Very few people enter into the good land, the promised land. They stay in the wilderness, walking in circles, walking in circles, and they die there. And it's sad. And it's sad. It is so sad. We need to have the revelation of the truth in Jesus, not only who he is and what he died to give us, but who we are to be in him and for him, that we with our lives can bless his holy name, that we with our lives can give to him his inheritance. He died to have an inheritance, and through his death, we have an inheritance, which is salvation. We are his people. If we know him, if we don't know him, we will say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. On that last day, when we stand before him after this life on this earth, we have to understand that he died for an inheritance. His inheritance is a people. And we are that people. And we are to enter into his rest. So Numbers 14, 29 through 30, it says, The carcasses of you who have complained against me, this is the Lord speaking, shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. So only two people out of a whole generation of several hundred thousand people entered in. The whole generation died. That is astounding. So now we're going to talk about, we've talked about the complainers. Now we're going to talk about the possessor of the good land. Numbers 14, 6 through 9 says, But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. This is Caleb speaking. So we're going to break down this scripture. I suggest memorize Numbers 14, verse 9 verse 8 and 9, but especially verse 9. So we're going to break down verse 9. Verse 8, we're going to start at verse 8. If the Lord delights in us. So if you go to Hebrews 10, 38, it says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul 
has no pleasure in him. That is the God speaking. If anyone draws back, his soul has no pleasure in them. We draw back in fear. We draw back when we complain. We draw back in unbelief. And we draw back by going and remaining in the wilderness or even returning to Egypt and not going forward with him because we think it's too hard. So this life is a life of advancement. It's not of retreat. Because in Romans 6, 13, it says, and do not, this right here is so good, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, I always read out of the New King James Version. And when you go through... This word instruments, instruments of righteousness, and your members as instruments of righteousness. In Greek, the word for members, it's an implement or utensil or tool, especially offensive for war. It means armor, instrument, weapon. So our members are offensive weapons of war. That's what that means. That is what that means. And do not present your offensive weapons for war as instruments of unrighteousness, or your members as offensive weapons of war of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as offensive weapons of war of righteousness to God so sin out of sin comes unrighteousness out of holiness comes righteousness because the nature of God is holiness the nature of Satan is sin and the ways of God is his righteousness the righteousness is the activities the ways the thoughts of God and it comes out of his holiness so if we are in sin we are waging war against God we are waging war we were built to wage war not to be defensive against war to wage war we are to offense be on the offense not on the defense according to the Bible according to the Word of God so when we are in sin, we are dwelling in death, waging war against God. But when we are in righteousness, we are waging war against darkness, against sin, against all unrighteousness, against the enemy, against the giants, against the things that rise up against us and rise up within us that is enmity against God so we are to wage war against these things for God not against him how do we do that walk in obedience the highest form of spiritual warfare is to walk in obedience obedience so in 2nd Corinthians 10 4 the same word that is used for members in Romans 6.13 is in this verse. It says, for the weapons of our warfare. Now, weapons is the same word that they use for members. No, as instruments. Weapons is the same word that they use for instruments in the previous verse we talked about. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That is our position. It is not a position of retreat. It is not a position of turning back, but it's a position of advancement and going forward and waging war and not running from it. We wage war through walking in obedience as the righteousness of Christ. We are to take territory for the Lord 
and his kingdom. And Caleb is an example of that. So when we talk about typography or typology, it's, it's when we see Christ in the Old Testament and, and it gives a picture of the New Testament. And so when we read this account in Numbers, it is an example to us of taking territory for God, the kingdom outside of us and within us is to take territory for God in our environment and is to take territory for God in our soul. Because because there's enemies of our soul and that is in our soul and they need to be cast out but God is with us and we are to take possession of the land for Christ so it says Matthew eleven twelve, and from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violence take it by force this scripture I did it was not not clear to me always but it was clear to me when i read the account of caleb that caleb is the example of taking of the violent taking it by force possessing the good land taking the kingdom for the lord jesus christ within us and outside of us that is what that scripture means that is what it means Another really neat, incredible thing that I have noticed when I was reading Numbers. Oh, this is going to make me cry. I don't know why it makes me cry. <laughs> I don't even know why it makes me cry. In Numbers, it's, it's in, in chapter 1. Uh, they also have it, I don't know, I have it in my notes somewhere, but it's in Numbers. A census was taken of the priests, right? God told Moses to take a census of the priests and the males eligible for the military to take the promised land. He said, take a census of all the able fighting men that we, to, for, for them to prepare an army to advance, to take the promised land. I don't know why it makes me cry. <laughs> so in Luke, what happened in Luke? Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she was bearing the child of Jesus and it was on her, her last uh, uh, trimester when she when right before Jesus was um, to be born the the governor of the land the Roman Empire they proclaimed a census to be taken that's why they had to make the the journey to Bethlehem now why is this profound because when Jesus was born, a king was born. And with that king is a kingdom. And that kingdom is when the Lord, when, when, when he grew up and when he started his ministry, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand because he was the kingdom. And when he died and resurrected to bring many sons into glory for us to be brought into him and him into us, we became the sons and daughters of God, the kings and priests of the Most High, the co heirs, co laborers, the bride, the church, the army. We are the army as in numbers when they took a census of all the able warriors to possess the land. They also took a census in Luke when Jesus was born, who would born a king, a kingdom. And of that kingdom was an army, which we are, who we are what? Charged by the Lord to go forward, to subdue, to conquer in his authority as an army. Do you see it? It is incredible. <laughs> it is incredible. It's very symbolic. He will bring us into this land and give it to us. So reliance is on God, not human effort or strength. Because 1 Peter 1 5, it says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith? Our faith keeps us. That is the power of God, is the faith within us. 
In Psalm 147, 10 through 11, it says, In his mercy, he fights for us. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. That is a picture of Caleb who knew God's ways and God's word and followed him and clung to it. And he hoped in God's mercy that it was by mercy's power, by God's power, by his strength, by his mercy, he would bring the Israelites into the good land so they can possess it. It's by God's strength, not our own. And the Israelites were looking at themselves. They weren't looking at God. Caleb looked at God. So Ephesians 6.10, it says, Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might because it's his power that works in us mightily to will and to do for his good pleasure that's why we need to be renewed according to our mind renewed in our mind according to the spirit according to the word that we can walk according to the spirit and not walk according to the flesh So the next section, and this is still um, November, uh, November, Numbers 14, verse 9. Only do not rebel against the Lord. So the ten spies who rebelled against the Lord through complaining and unbelief also, oh, this is so sad. This almost makes you cry too. Also led the rest of the Israelites to wander in the wilderness through their words and influence. This is very profound. If you go to Joshua 14, 8. It was Joshua and Caleb who were of the 12 spies. They were the only two that brought back a good report. The rest of them complained, okay? In Joshua, Joshua says, Nevertheless, my brethren, my brethren is the 10 other spies, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly follow the Lord my God. So we have to understand when the Israelites, when those 10 spies came and they gave the bad report and they complained and through unbelief and they brought back fear and not faith, they led the whole, the whole generation into unbelief. And Joshua said that they made, their words made the hearts of the people melt within them. This is so incredible. We have, this is severe. It is serious. We have to be mindful of our mouth. We have to be mindful of our words. Cause when we complain, when we, um, bring in fear, complaining, even criticism, doubt, the report of our conversations, it has an influence and an impact of the people around us. And it is through our own testimony of our mouth that we can either give hope and faith or we can subdue a people into unbelief and fear who go into the wilderness instead of into the good land, the promise of God, and they run the risk of dying there. The 10 spies led hundreds of thousands of Israelites into unbelief, into fear because of their words, because of their complaining. We have to be so mindful we have to be so mindful. Only two. Do you know that God says everyone 20 years and under, only they would enter into the, the, the promised land, but everyone else, they would die in the wilderness. And he said 40 days, a year, for every day that the spies scouted out the land were they to bear the guilt. And the children bear the guilt of the parents. That's heavy. Yeah. This is so serious to God. As he was then, then he is now. Yes, we are under grace. But we have to, we're going to talk about this. The, the patterns and the examples of the Old Testament is for us to learn of, to know the ways of God. 
his 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 desires and his commands and you know the the ten commandments never changed because jesus came on the cross and and just his ways did not change he still remains a just and fair judge he still rules with righteousness so we carry on so nor fear the people of the land and Deuteronomy 31 verses 5 through 6 it said the Lord will give them over to you that you he's talking about the, the giants of the land the Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I commanded you be strong and of good courage do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God he is the one who goes with you he will not leave you nor forsake you we are not to fear the people or circumstances of the land because it is God who goes with us who will do all things that he has commanded us to do he fulfills his word and he will do all things that he has said and we are not to fear because it is by his power by his might by his guidance by his hand he leads us now we're going for the, for they are our bread. The giants, for they are our bread. So we are to feast upon difficulties and not be defeated by them. Temptations, difficulties, trials, obstacles are for our food to strengthen us and to grow and mature by. God has said throughout the New Testament that we are to commit our souls in suffering to a faithful creator because it is him who is providing for us behind the hardships and the difficulties we do not see the purpose but God does and he is with us and we are not to retreat we are not to fall back we are not to fear we are not to succumb to defeat because God says that this is for our bread it's food for us because the food strengthens us it strengthens us it grows us and it matures us because this is about life life in Christ when Christ is in us the life of Christ is in us and out of that life the seed is formed to grow up into the mature stature of Christ within us that is the purpose of being reborn is to grow we are to grow and in order to grow we need things to mature us, to challenge us, to cause us to go forward. So James 1, 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, First Peter 1, 6-7 In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's for the refining of our faith. We need fire to burn out the dross so the gold can come forth. The gold is our faith. The only thing that we will keep in eternity is anything that we've done for God and anything that is of God. That is the, the, the treasure and all of this stuff burns off the, 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 the refute, the garbage, the, uh, the old ways, the tarnish, and it brings forth the gold. 
So they're, and I just want to say, they will be food for us. That includes the things in our soul, whether there is, is mindsets, um, 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 brokenness, fractures. There's, there's things from our past that if we have demons, it's not to retreat from. It's for our food. Why? Because the protection has lifted from the enemy. And we will go to that next. But for um, their protection, oh, that is next. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. He's saying, do not be afraid of the people of the land, for their protection is lifted from them, for the Lord is with us. So in the New Testament, for us, Matthew 28, 18, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Luke 1019, it says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Why? Because the protection has lifted from the enemy. If we are in the sight of God, we are under the protection of God, and nothing can come against us. But if we are on the side of the enemy, the protection of God has been removed, and the enemy will devour us. That is the truth. Walk in obedience under the protection of God. Walk in sin. In disobedience, the protection of God lifts and we will be devoured. That's the truth. So 2 Peter 1.3, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, knowing his way is and following him, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Ephesians 3.20 now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that work in us according to the power that works in us we how much of the power that works in us is dependent on us if we are in the word if we are in prayer if we are walking in obedience if we are living right if we are seeking the lord the power that works within us increases and increases and increases because you can have a belief in God but have very little power if none at all because you do not know him. We need to know him. We need to pray. We need to spend time with him. We need to seek the knowledge of God because with the increase of the knowledge of God, the increase of Christ happens within us because we don't want an increase of ourselves we are done we die to ourselves it's done there's going back to ourselves is going back to egypt we need the increase of christ james 4 7 it says therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you why because the protection is lifted from him because you submit to god he has to flee because you're under the protection of god and the protection of the enemy of his right to devour to kill and destroy has been vanquished through submission to god so matthew 28 20 it says and lo jesus is saying this i am with you always even to the end of the age so that's the New Testament breakdown of Numbers 14.9, which I encourage you to memorize that scripture and speak it out whenever something comes up against us or within us that causes us to go into unbelief or fear. So to walk in his ways, how do we possess the land? We walk in his ways. Because in Deuteronomy 30.16, it says, In that I command you today, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, and that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Chapter 30, verse 20, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. So 
Life is Jesus. Jesus is our reality. He is the true life. And we are to cling to him. Cling to him. So I'm going to take a moment to discuss, which is typography. All right. So typography is the New Testament indications of patterns and people in the Old Testament who were, in a sense, created to serve as a prefigured shape of what Christ would be. So typography is Christ in the Old Testament, revealed in the Old Testament. And he is in from the beginning to the end. He is in it all of it. There is types of Christ. There are types of us as believers in Christ. They are patterns. There is pictures. And I, this is my passion. I go line through line digging for the treasure. The treasure is Christ. Christ is the treasure of heaven and earth. And in him are all the riches of God, of wisdom and life and knowledge. In him is the treasure. And this word we are to dig. And I dig looking for him. And in doing that, he is revealed to us. Why? Because first we are natural, then we are spiritual on this earth. Actually, on the, on, in eternity, first we are spirit, then we are natural. But on earth, we are natural first until we believe in Jesus and he comes into our spirit and we are born in the spirit and the spirit becomes one with our spirit and then we become spiritual. So God, he is so good. He is such a father. What did he give us first? The Old Testament, which is the natural, and then the New Testament, which is the spiritual, so that by the natural we can see the spiritual and then as we grow in the spiritual, we can see more of the spirit and the natural. Do you understand what I'm saying? The natural, because, all right, so the Israelites, before Christ came, they had the scriptures, the Old Testament. But then when Christ came, he says, you search the scriptures, but they are written about me. If you see, if you believe in me, if you believe Moses, you will believe in me because he wrote about me. He said that when he come, that we would recognize him. Why? Because he's revealed. He's revealed by the Old Testament scriptures. And when I read these accounts that are very in the natural about men who wage war in the natural, who conquer kingdoms, who follow God or don't follow God, we, us, as the spiritual in the New Testament age are able to reconcile, to consolidate, to merge the truth of the gospel, which is, which is revealed in the Old Testament, the gospel the seed of the gospel is sown in Genesis and the harvest of it is in Revelation and it's because we are natural first that we are able to take these stories and as we grow in Christ we are able to see Christ in these stories it's so good okay so the promised land is a type of Christ Christ is the good land all right that we're talking about in numbers. We take territory for him, Christ, in our environment and in our soul. In Colossians 2, 6 through 7, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. You walk in a land. We walk in Christ. He is the land. He is the rock upon which we walk on and upon and in whom we walk in. We are to be rooted and built up in him. He is the soil. He is the seed. He is the harvest. He is the land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land for our inheritance. And in him, in, in, in Psalm 23, it talks to, you know, the, the shepherd. 
that in the, he makes me dwell in green pastures. See, Christ is the shepherd and Christ is the green pastures because the green pastor to enter in is to enter into the rest of God, which is Christ in us. It is so good. He is the land that provides for us the water, the food, the rest. And Joshua is a type of Christ. And this is why I say this. So Joshua is a type of Christ and Caleb is a type of us, his church and his body. Because what? Deuteronomy 31, 7 says, Then Moses called Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel. See, Joshua was a leader. Caleb was just a normal guy who believed God and followed his ways. So Moses called Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. He's telling Joshua, you go with these people. You shall call, cause them to inherit it. Christ went first before us, and through his death and resurrection, he brought us in, to the victory he accomplished. He conquered death. He's the first brethren. He is the first of many brethren. Okay, we're going to go to another. So Deuteronomy 31.3, it says, The Lord your God himself crosses, he's talking to Joshua, crosses over before you. He will destroy, he's talking to Israel. Sorry, he will destroy these nations from before you and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you. Just as the Lord has said, Joshua went before the Israelites. He led them. And what does Hebrews tell us? Hebrews 2.10, it says, For it is fitting for him who is Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. He is the captain of our salvation. If you look the Greek word for captain, it's the a pilgrim, it's a pioneer, it's a leader, it's an author, it's a captain. He forged the way we followed. So in Hebrews 2, 12, 2, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God Joshua led the children of Israel Christ leads us Joshua led them into the land to inherit Christ leads us into the land as the captain of our salvation, the author and finisher of our faith. Now what about we? We as Caleb's. Because if you go to Romans 8.17, he says that we are co-heirs with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3.9, it says we are fellow workers in God's field. We are the co-heirs and fellow workers of God. We come up alongside. He leads the way. He takes us by the hand. And as he gives us the victory, we possess that victory. As Caleb says, let's go up immediately and possess the land because God is with us. Joshua, he says, I have wholly followed the Lord. And that because of that, the Israelites were able to follow him as Jesus did, as he was the first to capture life for a people who were dead and dying in darkness in a land that was death 
in darkness and he brought us in. It says we have been translated. This also goes with the good land. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. A kingdom is a land. When we take dominion, we take territory of a land. Christ is the king. He is the kingdom and we are his co heirs and become the kingdom and he is the good land for which we possess conquer subdue for him yes. we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love Christ is the good land Jesus is our captain he is our salvation we are his Caleb and we are to have no fear. Why? Because anything we fear because of what Christ has done has made that thing to become for us our food. We are not to be swallowed up, but we are to swallow up. We do the swallowing. We do the eating. We feast. Revelation 21 7 it says he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son this is a life of overcoming there's no other option than to go backwards and the Lord will take no pleasure his soul takes no pleasure in us if we retreat yeah. so it's the last point for our example has numbers 13 and 14 been there it's for our example because in first corinthians 10 5 through 11 the new testament paul says in reference to the account of numbers and deuteronomy when numbers is is they went in to scout and then and then they fell and they sinned by complaining 13 and 14 and deuteronomy 30 and 31 is the part two it's the sequel of that because they actually after the 40 years and all the israelites die and the 10 spies died of a plague right away that was their judgment for leading all the israelites into fear and unbelief but after their carcasses fell in the wilderness he brought them in to take the promised land and that account is in deuteronomy 30 and 31 but first corinthians 10 5 through 11 it says but with most of them god was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer now all these things happen to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come Jerusalem is a picture the Israelites are a pattern of his glory and his dealings and of his promises and of his warnings as God dealt with Israel so he will deal with us if we fall into the same things as Israel Jerusalem is a picture of who Jacob like Jacob wrestled against God of, of, of one a called nation who wrestles against God but it's also a picture of the great city the Lord's inheritance when the new Jerusalem and earth come the Israelites are a pattern for us of God's promises in dealings with his people we have to understand we need to read the Old Testament the New Testament Read, I read the New Testament like four times more than I read the Old Testament. I read through the New Testament four times and I go back and read through the Old Testament. I just, that's the pattern I do. But 
This is a picture and it's a pattern. And the New Testament is the spiritual reality.